So, welcome here, and uh, glad, that, glad that you can join us. For those of you who are visiting, my name is Phil. I'm uh, the other pastor here. And uh, I'd invite you to take your Bibles out, or get your phones app ready, or however it is that you get a Bible going. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Colossians today. Before you turn there, um, lots of times when I have five minutes to kill, and probably you do as well if you have a smartphone, if you're in the doctor's office or you're shopping with your wife, which probably means sitting in the car, uh, and you, know, you end up pulling out your phone and scrolling through news maybe. And for me, I, I flip over to YouTube and uh, try to find a quick five-minute video. And there's a couple of channels I really like watching that take about five minutes. One is called Daily Dose of Internet, and it's a bunch of like crazy and thankfully clean things that happen that are kind of neat to watch. And, uh, and another one that I really like watching is called How It's Made. Anyone ever see How It's Made, like, when you were a kid or growing up? It's been around for a long time. It's one of my favorite little five-minute clips. The first How It's Made I ever saw was how giant jawbreakers are made. And it's, it's really satisfying to watch. I was going to boot it up and show you, but it's probably more of a distraction than anything else. But go home, watch how it's made. It's pretty neat. It's cool to see stuff behind the scenes. I like watching how, why things are the way they are. I like trying to learn about why, you know, why, how is a jawbreaker made? Or what about styrofoam? Or, you know, how are McNuggets made? That's not one you want to watch. Or, how, or hot dogs either. Don't do that. It, it's not worth it. <laughs> so do I. Um, but this morning, we're going to look at a passage that kind of explains why Paul, the guy who writes Colossians, does what he does. It's a nuts and bolts kind of why I do what I do passage. And, uh, and it's helpful to see why Paul does what he does. He's a pretty remarkable man. And he's, he's been saved by the Spirit. He's on a mission to the world. And he's writing about it to Colossians. So if you can go to chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 24 down to 29 is what we're going to read. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. <clears throat> Colossians 4, 21 to 29. Here it is. Colossians 4, Colossians 1, 24 to 29. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That is why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Let's pray before we start. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that is contained within it. As we look to you, Lord, I pray that you would teach us, help us to obey you, help us to be your servants here in this place and outside this place as well. We just ask that you would open our hearts now in your name. Amen. <clears throat> so although it's not a main part of the passage, there is a bit of an interesting difference between versions that I'd like to point out before we continue. If you're reading out of an ESV or out of an NIV, you're thinking, boy, Phil, you just read something totally different. In the ESV and NIV, Paul says in the first verse there, I rejoice in my sufferings in my... For your sake, and I, in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. That's quite different, and it doesn't quite sound right to me. When I hear that and I think, Paul is filling up in his body what is lacking? Does that mean that Jesus' suffering wasn't complete? Like, why would he say it like this? It doesn't sound quite right. And so I did a little bit of study and commentaries, and the overall consensus is that Paul believes that he is suffering, and he is. He's in prison at this point. And he's suffering, he's going through something that needs to happen so that all the people might hear the gospel and thus trigger the return of Jesus. 
In Romans 11, Paul says this, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will only last until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. So Paul says, what Paul's saying in Colossians is in the same avenue of thought, that he's filling up the sufferings of Christ so that when the full number of Gentiles comes to, him, comes to Jesus, then the return of Christ will happen. Now that's a long time. There's 2,000 years of, of suffering and, and, and different communication of the gospel all over the place. But Paul is doing his part in suffering for Jesus so that the mission of God can be fulfilled. That's what, that's what uh, he means when he says, I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ. He's doing that, and we do that as well. It's part of the plan that God has for us, right? That, that we will suffer for the glory of his name to spread the word of God to the nations. It's hard work, and not everyone appreciates it. And, and some of us can, have, and will suffer for the cause of God, the cause of Christ, when we minister to Melfort and its communities. It's just part of what Jesus promised us. And, and so with that, we come to the first ingredient or the first nut and bolt of behind why Paul is doing what he's doing. And that is that he is proclaiming the entire message of God to you, to the Colossian church, and to you, the church, and to the world as well. The entire message. Now, Paul has a responsibility to communicate the entire message of God. And we have a lot of his efforts in this Bible. A lot of the letters that are in the New Testament were written by this guy, Paul. He was a prolific letter writer, and he was inspired by the Spirit to write to all these churches, and we have his efforts in front of us. Not all the letters that Paul wrote were included. And for example, we know that there's a letter to the church of Laodicea out there. That one didn't get included in the scripture because it wasn't inspired by the Holy Spirit the same way that Colossians was. But there is a lot in this Bible by, by Paul sent to many other people. And he was inspired to send the full and complete message to the church from God. Now, that sounds simple. But it's also quite difficult. Like almost everything God asks us to do, it's simple, we can understand it, but it's difficult because it's a big task and it's hard to do. And, and to communicate the entire message of God is a very important task. That's something that Paul did to the Colossians and it's something that we need to do as his church. And that's where it's simple to understand, but it's hard to do because... The entire message of God is not exactly a super popular message these days, is it? In fact, Christians all over the world are embroiled in various aspects of the entire message of God being communicated and it not going that well. Uh, we're tempted by the enemy all the time to modify the message of God so that it's a little more palatable because, let's face it, some of the things God says people just don't like. Right? Right. And, and we need to resist that temptation because we need to give everybody the entire message about God. And there are so many awesome things about the Lord that we can celebrate, that we love to talk about, right? That God has got all the problems and difficulties that you face in the palm of his hand. He is bigger than anything that you face. Some of us have had a bad week. We prayed about that before we started the service. He's bigger than any problem that you face. If you like veggie tales, you've probably heard the song, God is bigger than the boogeyman, right? And he's bigger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. And now it's in your head. You're welcome. You know, he is bigger than anything that you face here on this earth. And we can boldly walk through this life knowing that God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's a promise I remember every single week because I need to remember it every single week that he is always, always with me. And he loves you. He loves me. And he loves us so much that he was willing to come to the earth as a man, Jesus, and die for you. That's incredible. He was willing to lay down his life so that you could have yours. Jesus loves you that much. And if you believe in him, he will forgive your sin. 
He will give you the gift of everlasting life and he will eventually wipe away every tear from your eye. He will welcome you into paradise and you will spend eternity with our amazing God. If we repent of our sin and follow him, there is reward forever. We have such an amazing God. And all of those things that I just told you about come from the scriptures. And there are also other facts about God that come from the scriptures that we don't really like to talk about. Ones that we're tempted to hide or gloss over because we say, well, maybe this isn't really applicable anymore. Or maybe someone that I know doesn't really like that. Or we just live in a different time and these truths don't apply anymore. For example, the Bible has very specific words about the subject of sexual sin right? It says specifically in 1 Corinthians that the sins that we commit that are sexual are committed against ourselves as well. Not just committed against God, not just committed against other people. You actually sin against yourself. And the Bible says that all sexual sin, both heterosexual and homosexual, is detestable in the sight of God. Our world is committed to normalizing and sanctifying every kind of sexual sin. And so they don't like that message one bit. And in, it's in that area, right here and now, and in North America, that the enemy is hitting us harder than he's ever hit any other thing right now. In the area of sexuality, we are under attack. And there's no topic that brings about more hate these days than that particular topic. The Bible also says that the people who are not found to be following Jesus at the end of time or the end of their lives will spend eternity in a place called hell. This is not a place where the devil reigns and rules. It's a place of eternal conscious punishment where the devil, his demons, and those who reject Jesus will spend eternity for rejecting the gift of the Son of God. The Bible says also that men are the authority in the home and responsible for leading their wives and children in the ways of the Lord. They are the leaders spiritually and in their relationships. The Bible says that God created the earth in seven days. We believe that the Bible is the perfect, infallible, without error, word of God, revealed by the Spirit to the men who wrote it down. And we believe that Jesus is the only way to God. That there's not a whole bunch of different avenues. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except by him. We believe that truth is not relative. But that truth is found in the person of Jesus Christ. All of these are truths about God. And there isn't really, a, I was tempted to say that these are like the good truths and the bad truths about God, but it doesn't work like that because it, it, it's who God is and God is good. That's who he's revealed himself to be. And these are the truths that we uphold in this church because they come from the word. And what we believe about the word is that it is the truth. And we must communicate the whole message of God, not just a part of the message, not just the stuff that we really like, but all of it. Without the whole message, we tend to get overbalanced on one side or another. And we either offer a salvation that is so sugary sweet that it doesn't impact our lives at all and doesn't require change, or we communicate a message that is so heavy-handed we're known more for what we stand against than what we stand for. We have to bring all of the truth of God together and hold it in balance. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And we need to make sure that when we talk to people about God, that we give them the whole message offered in love. We must not shade the truth of God at all, even if it's in the hopes of coaxing a person into the kingdom. And I'm not saying that we need to beat people over the head with the hard truth of God. And I'm not saying that we only offer what we believe to be the nice things. We must be open and honest about what we believe, both the things that make life sweeter and stronger and the things that govern behavior and heart attitudes. You know what a great way to do this is? Share your testimony. Talk about what God has done for you. Talk about who you were before God and who, what God did in your life to bring, your, bring you to your knees and then what your life has been like after getting to know Jesus. 
that helps you bring some of the tough, what you might call the tough truths about who God is, into balance with the amazing grace of God. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's the, that is the, the gospel in a nutshell, right? And bring, that into, bring your story to play on this. Because it's really easy to bring across academic truth and kind of miss the heart. But if you can share, like, your 6 and 2, or, or a little bit, maybe 6 and 20, and, uh, and, and just bring across the truth of what God has done in your life, people will understand that, that God is much more than just an abstract set of rules or a policeman in the sky or anything of the sort, but a God who loves you so much that he was willing to die to bring you out of the place where you were, right? The truths that we consider to be really hard can be couched in love when we understand that this is a relationship and not just a list of rules that we obey. Use what God has done in your life. Be open and honest about the failures that you've had. All right? I w- we are all sinners. No one here has a perfect record. And if the, you're honest about what you're terrible at or you're honest about the thing that you have sinned in and struggled with, people who you're communicating with will understand that God loves you in spite of your, in spite of your sins and in spite of your faults, that he wants everybody to come to a knowledge of the truth. The whole message of God is powerful. And it's not just for one little group of people. It's for everybody. And that is the next thing in our passage. That's what Paul is talking about. It's not just the entire message of God, but that the entire message of God is for every single person in this room. Now, back in the day, that was a brand new thing. Back in the day, the Jews were very resented because it was like, well, we are the people of God. We're the Jews and you gross Gentiles. They actually called the Gentiles dogs. You Gentile dogs, you're not even allowed in our temple. So buzz off. The people of God are busy right now. When Jesus came and died for us on the cross, the Bible said that the veil in the temple was torn in two. And it signified the opening of the temple to everybody. That God no longer lived in a structure built by man, but that he was going to move into the hearts of people. And that's Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? How amazing is that, that Jesus, that God used to live in a tent in the desert. We read about that in the, in the Old Testament. The Israelites traveled through the desert and God lived in a big portable tent. It was a nice tent, but it was still a tent. And, uh, and then he moved into a temple. We read about that in the Old Testament as well. But then the temple veil was torn in two. And 40 days later, The Holy Spirit moved into the hearts of people. And now you are the temple of God. If you think about the significance of that, it should floor you. We often talk about going to church, right? Hey, it's Sunday, we're going to go to church. And so we all go to this building. But the Lord does not live in houses built by men. The Lord lives inside of you. You're the church. If people are going to go to church, they should sit down with you at Tim Hortons. That's kind of going to church. You're going to a person of the church. How amazing is that? That God lives in you. That we are the temple of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now this isn't every human. This is a person who has given their heart to Jesus, who have said, I need you to forgive my sins, Lord. I will follow you. It's not everybody. God is not in everything. God is not in everyone. He is in those who have repented of their sin and allowed him to forgive them and move into their hearts. He makes his home in your heart. He is always with you, no matter what your circumstances are. God has chosen you to be his house. So you are never alone. And his presence is always with you. It is his spirit, his Holy Spirit is a deposit within you for eternal life. I don't know if you remember back the first time you bought a house. It's always really depressing. 
uh, because you have to give a down payment. It's not like you can just put it all on your credit card. You actually kind of, or the mortgage or whatever, you have to give a deposit, a down payment. And depending on the, the value of your house, that can be a fairly significant amount of cash that's just gone. And it's kind of like, oh, I really wanted that, but I need my house. And that, but that deposit, that guarantees you your home. You give $20,000, that's your guarantee that you have a home to live in. The Holy Spirit is a deposit in your heart guaranteeing an eternity with Jesus Christ himself in paradise. He's given us the Holy Spirit himself as a deposit. If the Holy Spirit, God himself, is just the down payment on your salvation, imagine how awesome your eternity looks. It's incredible. It's kind of like the sun coming out on a winter day. It feels so good. It's amazing to re realize the truth that God, you cannot imagine the amazing life that God has prepared for those who love him. Because of Jesus, we have hope. Hope is huge, isn't it? Hope is so important. Hope is what gives, gets kids excited at Christmas time, right? Like it's not just moving a tree in. I have hope that will be presents under there at some point, right? And it's hope that keeps me coming back to the sad NHL team, the Calgary Flames. And it's hope that allows a fiance to buy a ring, and it's hope that's keeping the Syrian and Turkish workers going right now as we speak. Hope is the fuel that humans run on a lot of the time, right? And it's hope, this hope of glory that Paul speaks of that engages all humans from time to time. The hope of things to come. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because of Jesus, we have that hope. We have the hope of glory, not the despair of doom. Because of Jesus, we not only have hope of glory, but we have reassurance of blessing and companionship and peace right here, right now. Christ in you means so much. He is everything we need, and he's all you really have. The question I have for you, the question you'll unpack in your house churches later is, does this truth affect you every day? Does this sit in your mind and heart because I know that it can and it can affect everything that you do. I was really brought face to face with this over this last week through the fasting. Um, and I, I don't often take a meal off just to pray. And it's not just not eating lunch. It was committing to 60 minutes straight of prayer in, in my, own, my own life. And, and so I walked and prayed and I was so glad that I could walk and pray. And I was found that I was able to speak with God at a deeper level without really struggling for the hour. The hour flew by. It doesn't often happen like that. And I was able to pray for many of you by name. I was able to pray for our church leadership by name. I was able to pray for the, the future, not only of my own life, but the future of our church going forward. I find, and again, I'm, I'm so embarrassed that I have to relearn this lesson but I prayed for more time than I've ever prayed for a long time. And I had more time than I week to accomplish things than I ever have. How does it work that I commit more time to doing something I never do? Never. I don't do as much. It sounds terrible. What pastor never prays? I pray a lot, but more time. And yet, and always worry about budgeting and oh my goodness, I'm not going to have time to do this, that, and the other thing. And God said, what are you even worried about? You're too busy not to pray. You better be praying. And I think I can pass that challenge on to every single one of you. Because we're all busy. We always come and we, we call someone and we're like, hey, I know you're busy, but I'm going to ask anyways. And God says like, yeah, you guys are busy. You're too busy not to pray. Invest in me. Pray more. The Bible says, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So get this, guys. If you do what God wants you to do, he will bless you. Who knew? Right? If God says you should pray continually, and you pray continually, he will be pleased and he will reward you. It's like one plus one is two. And God says, like, just do my math. Spend time with me. I'll bless you. I'll help you. 
Don't try to do it all yourself. Our God truly is an awesome God. He lives in you. That is the hope of glory. And there is so much to come. You're too busy not to pray and spend time with the Lord. I hope this week has at least helped you to show that, to see that, sorry. Finally, God gets practical and he brings us back to the mission that Jesus sent us out on, that we're to be disciple makers. So take a look at verse 28 and 29. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. <clears throat> that word, so, at the beginning of 28, so we tell others about Christ, that takes into account everything that's come before. Because Paul is participating in the sufferings of Christ, and because he's giving us the whole message, and because Christ is for everyone, this is why he does what he does. It's a lot like the beginning of a disciple's life, this warning and teaching. It's a lot like actually the beginning of a child's life. When a child's born, it's learning everything for the first time. It's learning how to walk. It's learning how to talk. It's learning how to add. It's learning how to subtract. And kids, we all learn for a long, long time. And as we learn, we have to be warned and told, uh, no, that's not the way you do that. Or, mm, I don't think you should, you know, do this. And, and you kind of coach the kid along and help them to do what they need to do as best as they possibly can. That's exactly the discipleship process. A person comes to know the Lord, and then they begin the discipleship that God has made possible by giving them the Holy Spirit. So at first, when a believer comes to know the Lord, there's a lot of things you got to change. You know, like, who? if you hit your thumb with a hammer, you probably shouldn't swear, you know, or that's, that's a really small lesson. And by the way, like that whole pornography thing, you should probably, leave, you need to leave that behind. And, and this and that and the other thing. And as a person grows and becomes more mature in the Lord, it's not about the big flashy sins that you, everyone can see. It becomes more a matter of the heart. And then the Lord drills down into the heart using his Holy Spirit and using all of you. And that's the discipleship process that Paul is talking about. We tell others about Christ. We warn everyone. We teach everyone with all the wisdom that God has given us. And here's the goal. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship. So that discipleship process, unless anyone got the perfection star, is continual. It never stops. You never, you're not going to be perfect in this world. So our goal as disciples and disciple makers is to present everyone that we are around and in a discipling relationship with as perfect before the Lord Jesus. And that's all, that is the operation of the programs of our church is to help in some way to get you towards perfection in Christ Jesus. All right, there's lots of things going on in our church for that. There's one-to-one -one efforts where you meet with a more mature believer and they help you along in your relationship. There's small prayer groups that are intimate, tight groups where people share how they're doing and how we can pray for each other and what we're dealing with. And we allow people to speak into our lives, sometimes very, very bluntly, about what needs to happen so that you can succeed. There are formal Bible study groups. There's informal Bible study groups. There's groups like Grief Share that help you to work through different things in a way that honors the Lord. Sign up for Grief Share if you want to sign up for that. There's one that we really want to get involved with that we started during COVID, and that's House Church. We're always looking for leaders for House Church, and we're always looking for people to join one. And, and if you're interested in that, they meet at different times during the week, depending on the leaders. Talk with Lindsay. She's over there. Talk with me. We would love to get you into a group of people so that you can plug into the deeper life that God has for you. That is the, probably, I think, the best way to plug into deeper life at Park is to get into a house church. It's a way for you to dive into a community group with people who are of like mind, but perhaps a different stage and a different walk of life. 
and you can get to know them more intimately. You can understand what God is doing in other people's lives. You can engage with them in casual or deep conversation. It's a way for you to dive more deeply into your relationship with God, to take what we do here one step farther into practicality. You know, it's kind of con the content delivery thing. That's one step in your discipleship. We need to take it much, much deeper and practically. But Park Avenue is a family of faith that in intentionally disciples the next generation to connect with each other, grow in relationship with God and one another, and serve the world. We believe that the most important part of that growth is in community with God and each other. Content is easy. And I'll always have something to say up here, like it or not. And it's easy to think that sometimes just coming to church, just coming to the building and sitting here makes you a disciple of Jesus. But that's just an incomplete picture. It's not like it doesn't work, but it's incomplete. Jesus spent three years working every day with his 12 disciples. Three years. And we need to be doing the same thing. We don't have three years. We don't know how long we have. But we need to spend all of our time that we spend together sharpening one another, discipling one another, pushing one another to be the closest to Jesus that we possibly can be. We need to be in each other's lives, in each other's homes, doing everything together. The goal of all of this is to present one another as perfect in our relationship to Jesus Christ. So we're never done. And if we're pointed in the right direction, it's that godly mass thing again. This is God's will for us. We know that because Jesus said it. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. So if you're making disciples, you're doing God's will. If you're doing God's will, he is going to bless you. Sometimes he will bless you with something that you absolutely love to experience. And sometimes he will bless you with a trial that you will absolutely not like, but it will do you good. It's a lot like Buckley's, right? It tastes awful and it will do you good. And I think that God is a lot like that. Sometimes we just love the blessings that he gives to us because they feel nice. Other times we don't love the blessings that he gives to us because we're not sure if they make us feel good. But the overall goal of the Holy Spirit is to work everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his good purpose. How we feel about it, it's pretty subjective. But it's all for the good of those who are called by God. And for Paul and for us, we get the aid of the Spirit within us. We talked about this in our adult Sunday school class. If you wonder about what's going on at adult Sunday school and while I keep talking about it, it starts at nine o'clock. It's right over in that room right there. We'd love to have you join us. But we have the Holy Spirit within us and he gives us the energy to do what we're doing. Paul works hard. He says, to this end, I struggle. I, to this end, I work and struggle with all his energy that so powerfully works in me. That energy is in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will guide and direct and comfort you as you walk. The message that the Holy Spirit has given to you is perfect and good. And it is for every single person in this room. And no matter what age and stage you're at, you can love one another, you can be open, you can be honest, you can have the common goal of presenting one another as perfect in their relationship to Jesus Christ. To accomplish all this, we get the person of the Holy Spirit who we can lean on to, to help us accomplish this mission. That's why Paul does what he does, and I'm pretty sure that's why we, that I'm not pretty sure, I know that it can be the same goals for us. Let's pray. Lord God, we are grateful that you have given us uh, so much help in accomplishing the mission that you've given to us. Lord, we have your word. We have the writings of many people that you inspired. And we have you yourself within us, helping us and directing us and comforting us and guiding us. Lord, may we lean heavily on you as we spread the word to Melfort and, this, and these communities. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.